Hi, how is everyone? Um, this is our first tape for the semester for a Speech 622, Voice Disorders. I am Jerry Kohler. Um, some of you know me, some of you don't. I know some of you electronically, and I don't know the rest of you. Um, but I'm sure this will be a, a positive experience for both of us. Um, I have taught this course um, actually a number of times, but I have never taught it online. So it should be interesting to see how this goes. Um, all right, <clears throat> we're going to move on. This is the text, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a textbook that I had referred to. Um, it is posted on uh, in the syllabus, which is in Blackboard. Um, I hope you are able to obtain it. Um, it's a classic in the field. Um, I have to tell you a, a, a secret. When I took my first course in voice, it was uh, 1973 or four, not sure. Um, and we used the book, The Voice and Voice Therapy by Daniel Boone, um, first edition. Um, we're up to ninth, um, and we're moving on along. It, it continues to be a classic in the field, and so I think you'll enjoy it. This is Daniel Boone. Um, we're actually going to see, I hope, a clip of him later on introducing the course and introducing um, the text. Um, I, he has been around for quite a while. Um, we have to put that in perspective. If he wrote a book already in the early 70s, and it's now 2017, this book was written about a year and a half or two years ago, um, he's been a very productive individual. Um, part of his legacy is he was, at one point, in the mid-70s, the president of the American Speech and Hearing Association. And um, as the next slide shows, when I received my certification in 1976, there it is down there. Um, look who signed, President of ASHA, Daniel Boone. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm proud to have this. Okay, I think enough with the small talk, we probably should get on and learn a little bit about voice. What do you think? All right, so today's goal is to review as best as possible <clears throat> the major issues in um, chapter one, which is an introductory chapter, and, and so it really is going to scan quite a few different topics, none of them in, in extreme depth, depth, but we're going to do that as we move on through the semester. Um, these objectives, I'm not going to spend the time, I'm not going to waste my time or your time, frankly, um, explaining this. I think you're all very capable of doing this, and they're listed in um, this welcome letter that is posted in Blackboard. Um, every week I'm going to, if, if I can, we'll be posting learning objectives for you so you'll have an idea what it is we hope to accomplish um, in, in that week's session. Okay, I do have them here if you go back over it. Um, as, as most of you know, what, I, what you will find in Blackboard is a copy of all these slides as well. So you can always go back to that, and again, it is listed in the welcome letter. Okay, so we're going to begin, <clears throat> which is with perhaps a, a very important topic, and that is what are the functions of the larynx. Okay, and although there are multiple functions of the larynx, we're interested in speaking. Um, that's what we're here for. Our role is to evaluate voice, to determine whether or not it's normal, and if it's not, what why not? What is abnormal about it? And how do we go about remediating it? Um, that doesn't mean that's the only role of the larynx. It has other functions, and we need to be aware of them. Its biological function, and its most important biological function, whether you take an evolutionary approach or don't, um, it's, it's the respiratory valve. It's how we breathe. Um, it protects our airway so that when we drink a glass of water, 50% of that water doesn't go down the trachea, all of it goes down the esophagus. Um, and that's the function of the larynx. And we'll describe a little bit later how that actually works. It protects the airway, um, the vocal folds adduct. Um, we can cough if a little bit does get in there. We can clear our throats, if, as I'm, I'm doing quite a bit today. Um, I'll try not, because <clears throat> I'm sure it's not any fun in a microphone, but I'll try to cover. Um, and we do that. A second biological function of the larynx is it fixates the abdomen. It fixates, actually, the thoracic cavity. Um, if we close our vocal folds forcefully and we don't allow any kind of, of 
air movement vertically, either inhalation or exhalation, we fix the pectoral muscles and we give ourselves maximum strength in upper body. Um, and that's a biological function. Um, again, none of all of these are important. We know that mammals who have laryngeas, who do not speak, still have these. And so one would have to ask, well, why, whether, again, whether it's design or evolution is not relevant, um, but why would they have it? Um, what's the point? And the point is simply, um, again, for airway protection and for abdominal fixation. We also know that voice, here we're, um, we're describing it as emotional functions in the larynx, but actually we can substitute voice. <clears throat> we can hear, and we do, we hear emotion in the voice. Okay, um, I'm sure all of you, each of you, has had the opportunity, you pick up the phone or you, you take a call or something like that, you meet a person and they say something where the words themselves are neutral, but immediately you can sense that the person is tense, they're happy, they're unsure, they're, they're angry, you can hear the emotion in the voice. In fact, that's what we all say. I can hear it in your voice. I can hear it in your voice. Well, what does one hear in the voice? It's not the words. The words can all be the same. And in fact, if you look at your, your assignment, um, if you haven't looked yet, then please do. Your, one of your assignments for this week is to actually play around with that whole concept. Um, it's described in your welcome letter, so I'm not going to, again, waste your time now in talking about it. But I'm I'm requesting that you take this as an example and go through an exercise <clears throat> of demonstrating how emotion shows in the voice. It's something we all know. Um, let, let's play with that. Okay. Um, we also know that the emotional state dictates how the, the larynx is positioned. And again, that's part of the exercise. And Boone talks about this. Um, pretty clearly in, in the chapter, and, and obviously you're going to be reading that if you haven't yet, and you'll see more about that. Again, I'm, I'm, my goal, and I can, I'm going to say this a couple of times today, but hopefully not again, is not to bore you with details that I think are important, but details nonetheless, um, and I think very, very clear to you, both from reading the slides and from reading the chapter, and so we're not going to talk about this a whole lot. Okay. <clears throat> We seem to be concerned mostly with voice as a communication function, as a linguistic function. Okay, voice holds spoken language together. Okay, um, when we speak, we speak with voice. Now we know that we have voiceless sounds, but we don't have voiceless messages. Um, I mean, we could speak in a whisper, um, but not consistently, and that's certainly not something that we do often um, or chronically. Okay. Um, often the message, as this third bullet tells us, is that the voice is what carries the message um, as opposed to the words. Okay, so the voice itself has linguistic function, even though the voice is, is independent of language. Okay, Boone goes to great length, and, and I'm not going to, frankly. Again, this is something you could read. It's simply numbers and statistics. And I'm not sure how critical it is to, to know all the details. Um, I think it's important to have the, the concepts. Okay, um, and talks about incidence and prevalence of voice disorders. Um, I can tell you now how this ends. Um, this ends by Boone making the point <clears throat> that voice disorders are not a one in a million um, chance that this is something that happens and it happens quite a bit. Um, there's a lot of people out there who have voice problems. He's going to look, and we will look at it also, um, different populations and, and how this works there. He's also going to go through pains to explain the difference between incidence and prevalence. I'm not going to go through those pains. Again, uh, you could, you'll read the slides at your leisure and read the chapter at your leisure, and you'll understand the difference. Um, again, th this is where he begins, the difference between incidence and prevalence, and I'm going to skip this, but I, I give you the slide. Okay. We're going to move pretty quickly through this. <clears throat> okay. 
Okay, I, I don't want you to misunderstand my going through this as saying it's unimportant and you don't need to know it. I'm Please interpret it as it's simple enough that there's really nothing here for me to explain to you, and that's what I view my role as. Okay. What we know is that there aren't a million different studies on or different epidemiologic studies telling us how many voice cases there are in particular populations, um, certainly not in general populations. What we'd have to do is add up a whole lot of, of individual populations, but that still won't be correct because really no one has done any kind of significant work in a general population. Most of the studies, almost all the studies, have been in specific populations, and they've been studied simply because it's thought that there probably is a higher than average number of voice cases in that population. Um, given that, they're all um, kind of subjective and, and kind of predictive of lots of cases happening. But I think that if you walked in the street and you took random um, sampling, uh, the numbers would be lower. That doesn't mean there aren't lots of cases. There still are. Okay. Um, any kind of sampling um, may be biased based on how you define a voice disorder. Um, how do you get people to define whether or not they have a problem? Um, do you have enough people to make your sample reliable? Um, and all kinds of things like that that I, I'm sure you're all aware of from just studies of research design and statistics. Okay. Um, why do we care about this? And I think this is an important issue. <clears throat> is so that we can focus um, and looking at particular populations that we know or at least think are at risk for having voice disorders. Um, we know, for example, that children are screened for hearing loss in schools and they're screened for vision in, in school. They're not screened for voice. Um, one could ask why not. I'm, I'm pretty sure that the incidence of un unchecked, unfound, I guess, um, voice disorders in school is probably higher than the number of children who didn't know that they don't see well. Um, and yet we always will check vision. We don't check for voice. Um, okay. And so it's something that maybe, you know, at one day you're going to lobby for and doing some kind of a speech screening um, on, on unreported cases. In other words, not the cases that the teacher sends to you, but just randomly going into classes um, and doing some kind of screenings. Um, what does it cost us? Um, not children, they don't cost us a whole lot if they lose time from school, but certainly if employees lose time from work, that costs society quite a bit. Um, and how much does it cost to provide, and do we have appropriate healthcare services? <clears throat> okay, we have a bunch of statistics here. I'm not going to review them all. Again, I, you can all read the numbers. Okay, I'm, I'm really not going to chime in now until we start to talk about specific populations. But I will give you a chance to just glance. Okay, 29% is a pretty high number. Okay, and, and this is what Boone concludes, and that is that if, in fact, 7% prevalence is even close to accurate, then 20 million people have a voice disorder at any given time. That's a huge number of people. That is it's absolutely kind of astounding. Okay, you know what, we're going to stop here. Uh, you, you read in my note, I'm sure if the software allows me up to 15 minutes and we're up to 14 and something. So we're going to stop here and we'll pick up from this slide in, in just a minute, okay? You'll close this, open up the next.